Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Thanks for joining the 12th Annual Seek Forum's sixth lunch, of, lunch event, The State of Local Climate Planning and Needed Evolution, featuring um, Kim Lundgren Associates, Stopways, and the City of San Leandro. This year's forum is funded and sponsored by the Tri-County Regional Energy Network, BayRen, and SoCalRed. We'd also like to thank our additional sponsors, Terravede Energy, the Energy Coalition, and TRC companies for supporting and the planning efforts for this forum. Further, we'd like to give a huge thank you to our promotional partners who've helped tremendously. Their efforts are instrumental in ensuring SEEK resources are shared with a diverse audience so that more local governments can learn and hear from one another. Oops. Oops. <laughs> There are a few quick housekeeping things. Make sure to ask any through our chat box um, as we are in a meeting and not in a um, webinar and we'll be collecting them to go during the Q&A time. Um, keep yourselves muted so that the speakers can be hear heard clearly and unmute yourself when speaking. Um, I'd like to pass it on to our moderator for this webinar, webinar Maya Kitahara, who's the program manager at Stop Waste. Thank you for joining us, Maya. Thank you. Um, thank you all for joining us. Uh, so, and, and for that introduction, Kelsey. Um, so as you can tell, I'm not Mike McCormick, um, but he was supposed to be here and joining us. Unfortunately for us, but fortunately for him, he's in a beautiful part of our state where there just isn't good internet connection. But he was really planning on being here and really was looking forward to it. And, and you'll see his influence in the work that we're sharing. Um, so your hosts today are gonna to be three of us, um, Mike Steinhoff, Oife Mock, and me, Mia Kitahara. And I say hosts and not panelists because this is a conversation. We wanna share some of our observations and ideas and we want you to do the same. If you're here, you're probably, you have, have some sort of connection with climate planning and it can range. Maybe you're a certified climate professional who's written climate action plans for 20 years, or maybe this is your first year in an energy efficiency job. And it doesn't really matter where you are in your climate planning journey. We need all of your perspectives and insights. In the important work that we all do, we're often so busy with getting the task at hand done that we rarely have a chance to look up and take stock of where we are in the bigger picture and where we're going. So today, we invite you to let go of your immediate priorities and work, even if it's just for this lunch hour, and let yourself look at the larger context. And I mean, larger context, wow, the timing for this conference and session, right? We planned our session well before the IPCC sixth assessment came out, which told us again how dire things are. That's have a chance at the best case scenario, we need to eliminate global emissions by 2030. I mean, even though I already knew things were urgent, I still experienced waves of anxiety and grief last week. And I'm sure I'm not the only one. So I was actually really glad that we had this session scheduled for today <clears throat> because it feels like we need to come together to be in community, in, in our community of practice and really ask ourselves, are we up for the challenge? What's it gonna take? Yeah, there may be this renewed urgency, but urgency alone, is it gonna get us there or do we need to work differently somehow, more effectively somehow? So in the spirit of opening up those conversations, I think we can get started with a word cloud to get us engaging with each other. And I'm gonna pass it to you, Mike, for that. Thanks, Mia. So word cloud, hopefully uh, folks are familiar with this. You can see at the top of the screen there, there's a, a link to pollev.com slash Resilient SAN 839 and put in your, your pain points. Um, as you do this, take note that it'll take each individual word. So if you've got a, a little phrase or something, maybe join it together with uh, some dashes rather than space. But um, yeah, what are those pain points? And maybe it's, gee, I can never get this data or budget. Yeah, that's a big one. Or you can never really get at some important thing for uh, really, you know, advancing the conversation in our community that we know is important. Um, you know, 
opportunity costs, things that are left on the side, um, anything that's that's really uh, that you struggle with in doing your your climate plans, accounting, anything that's in this space, we want to hear it. Uncertainty, yeah. Data is always a challenge for sure. Access, um, that's a good one. I know data access is always a always a big challenge. Staffing, yeah, it takes a lot of time to do this stuff, for sure. So I think we can let this maybe go for another minute, but you know, one thing that when I look at these things, either there's a few but a few things that really stand out, like budget resources is huge, but the fact that they're they're kind of evenly spread, that, that to me tells me that there's there's lots of things that uh, we can improve on in, in this area. Um, really great responses there. Yeah. Right, so in, in some of these pain points like budget, there's some sort of underlying reason why there's a budget gap, I guess. Um, there's, there's something about what we're doing, I think, that isn't, isn't getting prioritized. Um, and I think part of that is looking at the greater context in which we're working. So I think as we, as we feel stuck in certain places, asking ourselves, well, why? Why is that um, is part of this exercise. Should I move on, you think, Mike? Yeah, I, I think we've, we've slowed down here. Okay. All right, yeah. So thank you for, for sharing your pain points as a starting place. We're gonna dig much more deeply into, um, into that conversation in a second when we have breakouts. Um, but we're going to start by sharing this uh, highlights from this document that um, the three of us, plus Michael McCormick and a few others who have been in the climate planning space for a while, put together based on conversations we were having in 2019 and reflections of, uh, over, over that time. And I will say this is a live conversation. Um, you know, things that context is always changing and our, our desire is to continuously evolve the practice to meet that. This document that we wrote was an expression in time and it's meant to be dynamic and not static and it's already outdated, we'll admit that. And so we put this preface in there, you can't read it here of course, but in the document you'll see that we acknowledge that so much has already happened since 2019 that we didn't really fully incorporate, but we wanted to put this out there anyway as a place to start the conversation and have it be iterative. And we really want you to join us. So our invitation, um, is to come explore with us and with each other all of these questions. What have we learned from a decade plus on local climate planning and implementation? What do we know and what do we not know? When we use data, what is it in service to? Who have we been engaging? Who have we not? And who will we really need for the work ahead? So in general, what's needed? Are there course corrections that we need? Do we need to let go of some things, carry things forward or build new? And I think we all recognize we, knew we need some sort of new adaptive capacity, new governance models, some new skills, knowledge, tools for the challenge that is really facing us. So when we, when we started to reflect on these things, we started by looking at what has happened, looking at the past. So we began by taking stock of where we've been. Since climate planning started in the 90s, local governments have led the way. We've made a lot of bold commitments um, written a whole first generation of climate action plans, and we outpaced federal leadership in our efforts to curb emissions. We followed this model of measuring GHG emissions, setting a target, creating a plan, and acting upon it. And this has gotten us to where we are today. So over the three decades or so, we've done a decent job at incremental reductions, and we've started to build momentum for bigger reductions. And that momentum will certainly need it for the three decades between now and mid-century. Or actually, if we're heeding the IPCC warnings, it needs to happen this decade, <laughs> right? So this huge drop in emissions needs to happen so quickly. We need more than just the momentum we have right now. But what? What do we need? I think that that dissonance is palpable for many of us. I mean, how many of you feel it, right? And what exactly are we facing today and in the next decade? It's nothing like the last three. 
right? We have COVID and the, and the recovery that's gonna follow. Um, we have this finally uh, due acknowledgement of social justice and economic inequity issues. We're already dealing with climate change impacts and the need for adaptation and resilience. There's more urgency than ever. How can we possibly be effective in this context of converging crises? Anybody feel overwhelmed? <laughs> so what seemed to work yesterday isn't gonna necessarily work tomorrow. And today is that moment that we take a step back and reflect and be honest with ourselves about the limitations of what we've been doing so far so that we can become more effective going forward. So Faye's gonna share with us some of the key observations we had as a group. And as they share, see what resonates with you. We'll have a chance you know, to share our own experiences in the breakouts next after this. Great, thanks Mia. Uh, next slide. Um, so there are primarily four uh, limitations that, that we elaborated on um, in, in the statement. And the first was um, how we tend to focus a lot on effects rather than causes. Um, we know that the root causes of many of our local emissions are really embedded in systems that are larger than our individual jurisdictions. So for example, um, we, we, we are limited even in, in building you know, public transit that like we have to be working with our you know, neighbors and, and regional agencies, if so even on that level. Um, we can't be, you know, helping folks to, to get to a, a more um, a GHG light um, lifestyle. Um, and then if you look beyond that to, to you know, a global um, economic system and so on, like that obviously is, 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 is something that is way beyond just control of, of a single city or, or a county. Um, linked to that, you know, we're, we're acknowledging that we can't actually achieve those goals that, that we set out by just losing our authorities alone. So going back to the transit um, example, we have to be, you know, working with, with our neighbors, we have to be, you know, working with different partners and so on. Like there's very little that is uh, under the limitation or authority of our city, primarily, you know, just looking at something like a building code or so on. Um, at the same time, um, we're spending so much of our energy on um, these GG exercises and, you know, trying to do them year after year and year, um, and that takes up so much staff time. And a lot of folks don't necessarily have the technical background um, to do the work themselves. So they're often you know, spending thousands and thousands of dollars um, for consultants to be able to do the work. And so on a math level, um, we are literally just planning just to plan, um, trying to do this bean counting exercise without being able to have the time and the resources to be able to actually implement and actually to, to act and, and, and do the things that we were trying to do to reduce the those emissions. The last point, um, after acknowledging that, you know, the GHG inventory might be uh, more useful kind of at a regional scale, uh, what we want to emphasize is that um, the local governments are uniquely positioned to be doing things like fostering the social cohesion and strengthening uh, dem democratic ins institutions, like really encouraging deep democracy participation in um, these, these civic engagement and so on, that is really necessary to, to look at a change in these systems that the root causes of climate change, acknowledging that climate change is not just a technical issue, but really is a social political issue. And that cities really have that ability, you know, at that um, community level to be influencing those things. Uh, next slide. Um, which leads us to the second point that we're, in, in the climate action planning process, we're very much focused on the technical um, kind of approaches. Even though we know that the main barriers to actually taking climate change um, action is political, it's social cult uh, cultural. It's these um, the lack of political will, it's the lack of ability to take on corporations and industries and you know the, the global um, economy and so on. But everything that we talk about uh, for the most part in the climate action plans really focuses on technical. Um, analysis and solutions like solar panels and electric um, vehicles and so on. Um, not that those aren't important, but that we're really just using the GHG inventory as the foundation and trying to center all the work around those, those uh, emission reduction measures rather than looking at trying to do the behavior change and or both, both the behavior change um, at organizational level and also at a cultural level, um, which is really what we need in order to get to um, 
you know, the, the type of scale of change that the IPCC report was, was talking about. Um, and, and when we are using GHG inventory kind of as the foundation, um, which maybe we'll talk a little bit in, in the next couple slides, we're really looking at just incremental change. And um, again, it's not that inventories aren't useful. There are ways that we can look at kind of the general trend and so on, but particularly when we're, we're just setting targets and trying to say, okay, 30% or 40% reduction, this isn't really motivating us to go all the way to where we need to, which is the carbon neutral um, society. Additionally, this really puts the emphasis on, on all of us just to be technical experts and we're really siloed. It's not seen as something that the, we as a whole organization, um, as you know, local governments or as whole communities need to work on. It's only seen as something as you know, the scientists or the technical experts that, that have this kind of expertise to, to tell us what to do. Um, and, and because of that, we're really integrating with existing strategies with um, work that's being done by you know, transportation departments or the city managers departments or recreation. There's a lot of opportunities that are out there where that we're not able to seize because there's all this kind of like education that needs to be done to kind of connect how is this amorphous, you know, metric ton of GHG connected to how people walk or bike or how people are, are playing and in, in outside in the parks and so on. Obviously we know those connections, but for folks who aren't kind of really deep in this work, we have to sit down and you know, make those connections for them. So there's really, um, you know, on the surface level, um, there, there's, a, there's a real disconnect between um, all of the community priorities, of jobs or affordability and housing that we then have to explain to people why our work is important to them. And lastly, um, we're, we're really kind of only talking to ourselves, which is mostly folks uh, who are planning backgrounds, who have technical backgrounds and so on. And again, going back to the main point that this, this work is really needs to be political and social cultural. We're not talking to artists, we're not talking to organizers. There's a whole group of people whose skills we are not able to, to tap into. And again, trying to achieve that um, societal kind of action that we really need to get to um, a carbon neutral um, uh, community. Next slide. Um, the next two points uh, that, that we highlight in the report is that there really are inadequate um, governance uh, structures and equitable community partnerships. You know, uh, community-based organizations have said over and over and over again that this work really needs to be centered around people and equity. And, uh, you know, they've been saying that for decades, and we're just starting to catch up kind of as a mainstream profession how that looks in terms of community-based planning. But um, folks... Who, who are not you know, equity experts who haven't been necessarily working in the field like that, they don't necessarily know what that looks like in practice. So we're often left with, okay, we're saying all these words, we know it's important, how do we do that? And that's kind of where most people are at, unless they kind of really work deeply and then build those partnerships um, with, with community groups. Um, there's, again, that disconnect to the implementation. And then lastly, um, um, there's kind of a limitation on how to share amongst each other. Um, oftentimes we're just recreating the wheel in multiple cities because there's this model, common action plans, everybody has got to do it. Um, and we're not really able to, to kind of share or have this collective learning. Um, it's often very piecemeal. It's you know just at these kind of forums and conferences, we're really able to, to share those best practices across um, different areas. Um, and, and again, like not at the speed that we need to, again, like looking at the IPCC report, only having eight years, we don't have time to be recreating the wheel over and over again. We really need to be, you know, trying to get at um, things that, that work and, and kind of um, scale it up and, and move forward. Um, so I think with that, I'll pass it back to you, to Mia. Thank you, Faye. Yeah, thanks for running through all of those and, and giving some color to the to our thoughts there. Um, now I'm going to dig specifically into the limitations of local greenhouse gas emissions inventories, because as Faye described, they are such kind of the crux of how we organize our climate work and inform what we think is possible. So these things consume so much time and resources that could be directed toward implementation. Millions of dollars spent by local governments to do it over and over jurisdiction by jurisdiction, which 
does lead to inconsistencies between jurisdictions and just general opportunities for user error to happen. Um, and we've observed that the frequent inventories short circuit the intended framework of measuring, planning, and acting, and then going back to measuring. So that we're in this kind of measure plan, measure plan, planning and an analysis, paralysis, feedback loop, um, which just gets in the way of action and putting all of the focus on local metric ton CO2E can actually blind us to the systemic nature and root causes of the emissions, again, like Faye was describing, and ignoring our role in emissions elsewhere, much of what we call scope three and kind of it's voluntary, actually limits our opportunities to contribute to a carbon neutral world as kind of recognizing our role in the global economy. And finally, it makes us feel like we're each on our own, which is inefficient, it's demoralizing, and it's untrue. We're in this together. So I'm going to show a few graphs that should look familiar to you all and use them to illustrate some of these um, limitations and some of the points that Faye shared. All right, here's where we started. Informed by AB32, we aimed at an incremental reduction by 2020. When our goal is some incremental percentage before below a baseline, then what's in the baseline really matters and that empty CO2E number really counts. And that makes sense because we're measuring our progress against the baseline of existing or past conditions. But when we start to aim for carbon neutrality, and again, here we go, moving that target date up a couple decades, when we start to aim for carbon neutrality, it matters less what our emissions totals were yesterday or today, and more about figuring out what our communities will look like in a carbon neutral or even a regenerative world. What conditions would need to be in place for that reality to exist? And how close are we to approximating those conditions? Measuring that would let us take a more systemic lens and approach to our work and transforming systems is what it's gonna take. And another way that we uh, tend to look at future emission scenarios, we assume other levels of government will also act on climate and we can count on certain amount of emissions reductions to happen in our communities because of it. For the first time here, we get to put federal wedge on this graph, which is nice. But isn't it kind of like taking uh, isn't it kind of like trying to bake a pie by asking each guest to bring a slice of their own and then smushing them together? It's not efficient and it's probably not going to taste good. But joking aside, <laughs> we are usually so busy trying to kind of claim the GHG reductions we're each responsible for. What if instead of going for attribution like this, we focus on contribution, where we all agree on the pie that we're baking? And we each bring that unique ingredient only we can bring, each level of government working on its unique contribution towards a common goal. We all need to work in concert here. So in what we measure, from moving from incremental to systemic, moving from attribution to contribution, it's kind of moving from something to something was a big focus of the statement we put out, um, as well as the conversation today. So, uh, Bay, I'm going to pass it back over to you to share some of more of those froms and twos. Yeah. Um, so, what are we what are we trying to work towards? We're trying to move away from this really like heavy focus on on GHGs to really centering equity, to really centering people. We want to be we're looking towards well being. Of, of people and we know that we can get there by doing these activities that reduce emissions um, that then lead to a more equitable um, and um, more more access to resources and so on um, that that everybody can then enjoy. Um, we, we, we've had this practice of you know just reporting out those top line um, GHG numbers and, and so on again like really focusing on on what each activity can can produce and so on. Um, which again leads to a lot of uh, uh, staff time to co calculate and so on. So we want to move towards actually tracking the activities that, that we're doing. What um, you know, how many people are biking? How many people are actually taking transit? Um, actually measuring the the things that we want to be implementing. Um, again, like we've had this practice of having each individual um, try and recreate these inventories and and so on. 
um, which don't actually capture um, the state of, of, of each um, um, city um, that accurately. Um, so, and we have to spend all this time, you know, um, creating those inventories and spending all that time. So we want to be moving towards um, having regional or state um, agencies do, do that part and being able to take those trends, which apply to most um, areas and, and most jurisdictions within that area, to, to kind of guide us in, in where we need to go if we're actually um, seeing the change that we need to, to see um, in those areas. Um, so again, like we, we've seen that uh, inventories are really, really time consuming, like trying to get down to each nitty gritty um, detail, um, which don't actually, again, like benefit us um, to, too much when we're actually trying to get to the implementation stage. And we don't need that much detail to get a project done. So why don't we simplify the process, um, get something more higher level, just so that we can get the general trend again uh, for, for that particular sector, energy, transportation, whatever, um, so that again, we can spend more of the time on the implementation on the actions. Um, with the old practice of having uh, the full responsibility held by each of the individual jurisdictions, um, we don't have a lot of ability to, to collaborate and um, to work with community partners or other regional agencies um, on this work. We keep having to recreate um, all these different collaborators and so on. So um, moving towards um, a model where we're really getting that regional state federal support for kind of services and, and programs we're then really able to, to work all together um, to actually achieve the things that, that we need. And, and knowing that the authority for a lot of the things that, that we need to see isn't really necessarily held by, again, those local governments. Um, and, and lastly, um, a lot of the um, greenhouse gas uh, emissions frameworks were originally designed for more of that national international policy. And that's, that's been scaled down to the city level um, as appropriate to, to try and, and, and squeeze everybody into this model. Um, but that doesn't really emphasize, again, the skills and um, the ability for us as local governments to uh, build the social cohesion, um, to do the deep democracy, to do the kind of like social cultural uh, shifts that, that we need to, to, to see. So why don't we, again, recreate um, a framework that can support those local policies uh, processes to have the application um, and really center people at the same time um, to move to to move towards um, um, a, a better uh, climate action uh, framework. Um, and I think um, yeah, I think that's it. And I'll pass it back to to me. Great, thanks. So we invite you to reach out to any one of us, or this is the full list of people that contributed to this statement. Um, to engage. So we don't want it just to, just to end today, um, but we are making space today, you know, so we want to hear from you. Do our observations resonate with you? How are they specifically showing up in your work? What do we need to move away from, let go of? What do we need to move towards? What's needed from us in this pivotal decade, right? So Mike, um, I'm going to pass it back over to you and stop screen sharing so that we can get folks in their rooms. Great, thanks, Mita. <laughs> Um, so hopefully folks are familiar with uh, the Zoom breakout room, uh, breakout rooms uh, sort of mode of, of working. So here in a moment, everybody's going to get broken up. We're going to have small groups of, I believe, six folks per room. Um, take a minute, a quick minute, get to know who else is in the room uh, just so that you can have a good conversation. And we have uh, Jamboard. So there's a link to the Jamboards. Uh, now in the chat, looks like there's a couple of them that they go to the same place. Um, your Zoom room will have a number. So you'll be in room number one, number two, so on. Scroll through those jam boards and find the room that you're in. So if you're in room number two, find the jam board for number two. Um, as you look at that jam board, you'll see, um, you know, it's a pretty low barrier to usability uh, tool. At least we, we found this one was, was probably the easiest to work with. Uh, on the sidebar, you'll see a number of sort of controls, uh, a little thing for sticky notes or text box, or maybe you just want to draw on it, but um, get those ideas down. So it's broken up into those, those three questions that Mia just talked. Uh, what resonates with you? How do the themes that we talked about here today show up in your work? What's not working? You know, 
get some of those other grievances out that, that maybe you've been thinking about. Um, and then what's needed? What are, what are sort of the next steps to, uh, to take us forward? Um, so we've got about 20 minutes for this exercise, um, maybe a little bit more. And yeah, we'll just go through, um, jot those things down. We will then return all back here. We'll maybe do a quick uh, summary of some of the things that, that folks have observed uh, going on in those jam boards. But this is really, you know, we want to, as Mia said in the beginning, start this conversation, keep this conversation going uh, long term, and, and we'll have some, some follow ups after we come back about where we'll take this information from here. Okay, anything else? Or I think we're ready to, uh, we're ready to go. Break out. Debbie, if you want to send us off for 20 minutes. Here we go. Thank you. People could join their group, their group. That would be great. See you on the other side. Okay, folks are back from the breakout rooms. Hopefully you had some really rich conversations. Um, Faye and Mike, I think I'm passing it over to you to kind of glean what we saw in the jam boards. Yeah, so there was a lot of really great conversation uh, it seems uh, that was happening. There's a lot of agreement on um, the uh, siloing of different departments and also just on the way that uh, government is structured, um, wanting more kind of collaboration and um, having sustainability or climate minded folks on that decision making tables and just being able to bring everybody together. Um, um, there was kind of a shout out for um, having a vision of where we we're going to and um, just the uh, working with partners and, and working with community groups and, and so on, having more um, input for, for what those needs are. Um, also like the, the focus on well-being and um, handing uh, inventories over to the, the regional and the state entities to, to free up uh, capacity um, for, for local governments. Um, that, that also brought up a points about um, there just not being enough uh, staff capacity and funding to kind of do, do, we want, do what we want. Um, and, and maybe that shifting time away from, from planning so we can focus more on implementation will, will help with that. Um, um, yeah, and then kind of reiterating kind of a more regional approach, um, more communities um, sharing their practices, successes, failures, different strategies, um, wanting like a better way to organize um, the things that, that we have. Um, uh, there was also the iteration that um, local governments have, are really focused on the quantitative and, and that GHGs will really play into that. Um, but that, you know, maybe we can shift to counting in you know, the more meaningful uh, indicators like percentage of homes that are all electric, percentage of vehicles that are um, EVs and so on. Um, there, there seems to be some, some talk about lack of agreement on what needs to be done, some controversy there. Um, and the singular city approach versus working on a region, working as a region to, to address the, the big problems. And let's see. Um, also some things about um, there being a mismatch on who's working on what kind of issues um, and uh, measuring impact and, and how it's time consuming and, and so on. Um, yeah, and I think those were those are kind of the, the main main themes are definitely a lot of kind of uh, similar thoughts across the, the different uh, sessions. So um, I think the Jamboard will be available for folks um, on the LGC website, um, along with uh, the rest of the session materials. Um, so you can definitely go back to, to kind of read through everything that folks um, wrote. And I'll pass it back to, to me. I think, uh, I think we actually have enough time for folks to report out if they feel fired up about something that they discussed in the group. Um, we might have time for a few folks. Does anybody want to share? I 
I could share something. Can you see me? Yes. Oh, sorry. Hi. I didn't see your hand. Go for it, Susan. <laughs> Susan Wright. Um, just one thing I just wanted to share because it, it was a little bit new that we, I, I shared in our group was um, learning from COVID and the messaging around that. And that um, two things I mentioned was one was the um, not being afraid to pivot um, to get to something that works better. And I think we saw that, that initially, I can't even remember what the initial framework was for helping people know what we should do, but then they shifted to the color system. And, and so I think about how much we are hanging on to um, our current system because it's established. And I do like the fact that you can see progress about that, but if it's not really serving us, um, that's something that's, I take inspiration from the public health people. The other thing that I think was really good about that purple to you know red to orange to yellow is that it was very clear and data underlying, underlies all of it but that it was a very public friendly, relatively um, system so that people can see where you're trying to go and where, you know, what it's gonna take to get there. And I would really love to see if our um, carbon goals could be framed in a way that is so simple and that people could really get around and, and, and know what we're all trying to do together. Um, I, I feel like our current thing is, is so um, it's difficult for us to do and to understand and to, and to work through, and now it's harder than ever to get the, the energy data, especially that, you know, I would love to see us figure out how to do a, a more public friendly um, framework. Anybody else want to share something that came up for them? You can raise your hand if you don't want to just start talking. Susan, uh, the other Susan. <laughs> yes. Okay. And thanks, Susan, right, for sharing your thoughts. Yeah, hi. I'd like to make a suggestion that maybe OPR or somebody like OPR basically um, give a directive to each of the COGS, the MPO, the COGS, to do a consistency check. Uh, for the sustainable community strategy for each of the climate action plans done for within a, the regions, within the, the COG uh, region. And um, I, because right now it feels like, I think, well, I think if that consistency check was done by all the COGs across California, um, it would result in much less uh, feeling of isolation by the various jurisdictions, and it would elevate the, the sort of level of knowledge across the board. Um, and it would also level sort of an economic playing field because uh, all the jurisdictions, at least within a certain uh, council of government region, would know that they would all be evaluated by the same criteria, at least relative to the sustainable community strategy, if not other criteria. But right now it seems to me like there is no structured oversight of the caps. And I really think that there should be. Um, we've got some beautiful laws underpinning the climate action planning work, but there's, as far as I can tell, there's no structured oversight. And I think it could be done through the COGS and it might be done through the air districts. Um, anyway, just a thought. Thank you. Role of the regional entities and the role of the state in relationship to the regional entities. That's so important. I think Aleka, we have time for you and then, yeah. Quick, Cause I gotta hop off, but I just wanted, uh, I, I learned a lot in my group. I was, uh, with folks mostly from Southern California. And I think just remembering that we have such different political realities in um, many different parts of the state in which we work. Um, so really, really great comments about the challenges there and um, just kind of trying to think about how to overcome that. To Susan's analogy about the color coding and public health, I agree, we have a ton to learn from public health, but I also, one of the things I think we're missing is people probably have a good understanding of like, once we get to that green, you can get back to normal. Here are the benefits to you. Here's what happens. And so I'm, I love that idea of thinking about how I saw a lot of comments about what does a carbon neutral 
community look like? You know, what can we tell people about those benefits? And I think it speaks to that political division as well, because let's be honest, we're not going to change all hearts and minds in time. So how do we translate what the benefits are in ways that are meaningful to people in different parts with coming from different perspectives? So um, yeah, those are, th this has been great, you guys. Thank you for uh, elevating all these ideas. Uh, thanks for sharing that. Mike, did we have any questions you wanted to? Um. <clears throat> I, mean, I saw I think, one from Kim. Right, there was one on Kim, and and he brought it up actually in the in our group as well. That I think is important about systems change and what are the systems. You know, I, I think well, we didn't we touched on it a little bit in terms of food systems in in our group, and you know, some opportunities to to really um, put forth a bold vision there uh, for for maybe how food systems could could work differently. But um, you know, I think. You know, one of the things that, at least as I've been thinking about this more, is you know getting out of the the sort of vertical silos of residential energy, commercial energy, but thinking about you know maybe what is it that communities do? What is it that communities provide? And they don't provide residential; they provide housing. So housing as a system and everything that's tied to that, and think about you know what is that vision for where people live and how do they get around? And sort of you know a way to you know create something that that maybe doesn't separate in terms of buildings versus transportation energy but you know what is it that um how do you assess the the carbon footprint of a resident across everything that a resident does and a business across everything that a business does i think maybe that would help think more about what the the systemic changes are ah totally like instead of looking at the building and the energy it consumes because it doesn't consume energy we consume energy in the buildings right but thinking about this shifting it from this technical to the people the residents and their lives and in our group we talked about jobs and like what what are people doing for their livelihoods versus like maybe that's different from focusing on the commercial energy usage like you're saying mike like what are our communities doing, not how much energy are they consuming while doing it. Yeah. Great. And Kim, yeah, systems. Did you want to say anything more? Yeah, I can. Um, you know, when we think about our water supplies locally, um, generally, and we're finding this and um, in San Mateo County and starting to work on it is that, you know, our wastewater and stormwater and uh, you know, water agencies are kind of in different silos. And so, you know, that is a system. And when you start looking at one water, you're talking about changing the system, right? You're breaking down the silos and getting people to work together. And I think that the discussion that we had in our group, um, because we had somebody who was very focused on food system and changes within that, that that's another area. Um, you talk about you know, the data privacy, you know, that's kind of a system. There's some standards that have been set that don't really take into account equity and social justice, and that's kind of become a system. So it seems to me that, you know, a brainstorming, looking what are all these different systems that, you know, we could be thinking about for change and how we would go about doing that might be a good approach. That sounds great to me. I think there's so much rich conversation to be had there. Um, so I think that can lead us kind of into our wrap up. Uh, Mike, maybe I can do a wrap up before we do the final word cloud. What do you think? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna suggest kind of the the takeaways from where we go next, um, and then that might also help people start noodling on how they will respond to your to, the, to our word cloud. Um, so, so we saw all these great comments on the Jamboards and we wanted you all to focus on the conversations and we want to take all of those great ideas and put the, pull them together into a bigger kind of visual framework using the mural platform. 
Um, so we will be doing that after this call to hopefully continue engaging this conversation. It feels like we just started to scratch the surface of many of these really rich topics. Um, so that, that's our promise to you all, is that we will gather it all together and try to synthesize it and, and see the patterns and organize it. And then it'll go up onto the CCC um, platform, I think. Um, but if you want to engage more, please email one of us um, or drop your name and email in the chat and we'll be able to collect it that way too. So the mural is one thing. Um, we are, we've heard this theme over and over of get the regionals and the states to do these inventories. Right? It keeps coming up individually from people and, and collective conversations. So we are going to, um, there will be a letter template that will be circulated, um, directed to address to CARB um, to see if they can just do these inventories for us. And as Faye pointed out at the beginning um, or earlier, it's not only to just take the workload off, it's like they will be able to see patterns across jurisdictions that we can't see each of us doing these inventories on our own. So for multiple reasons, it's, it's important that they get in there. Um, so that'll be coming forth too, so please watch for that. Um, and then Mike, maybe we do the word cloud now and I can just wrap up at the end. Okay, sounds good. Uh, so Faye is going to bring up uh, one more of these word clouds and uh, how are you feeling now? And maybe uh, you've found some new friends or at least some new ideas that uh, maybe have been kicking around in your own head. And, um, you know, I know when the group that wrote the paper got together and we started finding our uh, um, climate planning soulmates that, uh, yeah, it felt much better. So how are you feeling now? Maybe, but maybe you also feel overwhelmed. Well, now there's a whole new thing that we got to figure out. Um, but it starts here. Motivated, beautiful. Visioning. We all need visions to guide us. Ooh, he's alone in there. Hopefully the alone person. Hoping is, it was a not alone and the knock got cut off. Maybe not alone. Um, but if you are feeling alone, find someone to talk to. Um, there's someone that, that I'm sure shares your frustration. That's Motivated, good. getting started. Those are those are huge. Happy. I'm happy. Community centered. Absolutely. I think if, if anything, what we want. Um, community centered and systemic systemic change, yeah. Good work with the dashes. And I see opportunity in the chat, absolutely. Yeah, there is a huge opportunity here, I think, for, uh, for doing what we've all been trying to do for, for so long uh, and doing it better. Collaboration. Absolutely. I think if we, we start, stop doing it city by city, um, we can realize some, some other bigger gains. Health metrics, absolutely. Different kinds of metrics, all different kinds of metrics. What's gonna actually motivate people? Learning by doing, that is excellent, yeah. That's how we gotta figure it out. We gotta, folks have gotta jump out in front maybe, think of a different way. Let's do a totally different kind of a climate plan. Um, We'll figure it out. But hopefully, what have we got to lose, right? Try something new. And as we try something new, I think it's so important to share what we're doing, even if, even if we think it might fail. I don't know. It's like, um, 
oftentimes we only hear about the things that went well and the and the kind of case studies of successes, but there's so much to learn from what we tried too. All right. Okay, I think we're word clouded out. Cool. Well, it's a great, beautiful word cloud, and I think we'll we'll save it, um, Faye, and we'll we'll put that in the mural too. So again, um, the kind of takeaways here is that there will be a letter um, circulated that you can you you can use um, if you feel motivated to ask the state to do the inventories. Um, we will send we will create a mural to continue this conversation. And thirdly, I think the ask is for you to start talking to someone else in your network about what needs to change. We all were here, we were in this conversation, but the conversation needs to include everyone, right? Um, so, so yeah, those are kind of our takeaways from this session. Please stay in, engaged. I'm dropping our emails again into the chat so that if you don't wanna put your name here for whatever reason, or you have something you wanna ask one of us, um, please go ahead and email us. We are so open to having this conversation and continuing it. Thanks. And LGC staff, I'll pass it back to you unless Mike or Faye, you have any, any closing words too? Nope. Great. Thank you all. Thanks everybody. Thanks for coming and thanks for the conversation so much. I wanted to remind you guys of our last um, couple of sessions that are today and tomorrow. Next one's going to be in just an hour and then we got a couple more tomorrow to finish out this forum. Um, we really appreciate you all and we hope to see you at the next ones. <laughs>